Hey guys, Jay here. Welcome to Models and Memories Weekly, episode 10, Rogue Paint. Models and Memories is a show about nothing filmed in front of a live studio audience, and stay tuned all the way till the end to see a montage of painted models courtesy of the EOB Complete community. This is a show where I talk about my painting, modeling, and wargaming experiences from the week, and I end every single episode with a story. Now you might think to yourself, Jay, you put out three YouTube videos a week, and you put out live streams every single day. How could you have more to say? Well, I do, and here it goes. What a week to be a wargamer. I actually feel like I got stuff done this week, probably because I did, and uh, I'll start out with these Malifaux guys. I have been chugging along with these Malifaux mechanical doves for three weeks now, and I finally got them all finished up. I don't know if they're my favorite paint job I've ever done. They're very different to anything else I've ever painted. I mean, they're microscopic little birds that needed tons and tons of uh, fine detail highlighting work. Actually, the most frustrating thing was on every single feather. On the bottom, there was some pretty good texture so that the paintbrush could just ride on top of the texture. But on top, I had to pick out every single feather and highlight them individually. But I think they turned out okay and they are ready to game. I'm really excited to get some Malifaux playing in. They have some really fun rules like insignificance <laughs> and puny and demise. Demise, after this model is killed, the controller draws a card. I love gimmicks. Gimmicks are what make games fun for me. I really love models that like just do a silly thing. Um, Cause it's just more interesting. Like in, in games of 40K, like, it, it all breaks down into things like, oh, your infantry moves up and either gets into close combat or it shoots and things kind of become predictable. I love wild card, wild card elements. And I think that these mechanical doves are gonna be really fun in game. I tried doing a little OSL on the base to see if it would look like the erupting flames were casting lights and eh, so, so successful. I think, I think it looks Fine, I used my airbrush and a little bit of Minotaur Ghost Tint, which I don't get to use on a daily basis, but I think it looks all right. One thing that is a little annoying, or not annoying, but just the sculpt is not my favorite, is uh, this bird is jumping off of a hat, but there's like fire erupting, so is the hat gonna catch on fire? I mean, you know, those performers need that hat. But they are still super cute. And on stream, I finished a lot of stuff. I cranked out Cassandra Felton, who is the henchman of the Malifaux Arcanist performers. And she is actually a model sculpted in Weird's second edition when they moved their entire line from metal to plastic. And their original plastic line was like 5% smaller than the current line. Uh, I painted a bunch of models from their third edition, and this is a model from their second edition, and it is small. It is very small, with very, very small details. The face, it was hard to do a lot of work to the face just because of how microscopic it was. I think the model turned out really nice, but I'm glad that Malifaux has seemed to kind of beef, beef up their sizes in their third edition. But now that I have my, now that I have my mechanical doves, I have my henchmen, the only model left is to paint Colette Dubois, the master of my faction. And seems like a perfect time to transition to the uh, my New Year's resolutions, essentially. I know we're getting close to halfway, but I think now is a good time. I was looking at all of my painted minis and it reminded me a lot of uh, some videos I made in the past. So, uh, six months of painting in a pandemic and improving your painting by painting every day for six months. and. In that time, I painted a bunch of minis, but I feel like I've already surpassed that by a fair bit. So I thought, well, why don't, why don't I just make myself a list of the things I want to accomplish painting-wise? And so my the first thing I want to accomplish this year, painting-wise, is I want to finish painting Indomitus. Every Wargamer on the planet, it seems like, bought Indominus when it came out, because it was a great deal. And I bet like 1% have actually finished painting all 60 some of those models. I've painted the 20 Necron Warriors and the Reanimation Orator, the Necron Reanimation Protocol or the Reanimator, the Necron Reanimator, and uh, the 
Necron Overlord. Those those three units. Uh, there's plenty more. I haven't painted any of the Space Marine half, and there's a couple of other Necron units that I haven't, like the Scarabs and the uh, guy with the cape who floats. It's in the Indominus novel that I read. Um, Cryptic. The Cryptic. It's a Chronomancer or a Timomancer or a, uh, a Mattermancer. It's one of those. But I want to join the club of people who actually painted Indominus. And the Indominus models are some of the coolest Games Workshops ever made. So I definitely want all those models finished, painted, and in my army. Uh, and it just feels like a good challenge. Like 61 really nice, really intricate, and quality miniatures painted. I think that'd be a really, really good, really cool. Just be like, I painted Indominus. Clunk. That's what I want. My second goal is to have three more finished games. Now, a finished game is going to be, for me, like two armies, two fieldable armies, ready to rock and roll. If someone's like, oh, I want to play Frost Grape. I got the minis. Let's go. That's what I want. Now, one of the, two of those games are already picked out Malifo. I'm getting very close. One more mini for one faction, and then I need to collect another faction. Oh, darn, I got to buy more models. Probably something in the flavor of an Arcanist. No, wait, I had to collect Arcanists. Resurrectionists, because uh, they're really cool and zombie and monstrous. And then one of the games is going to be Star Wars Legion. Talk about this guy pretty soon. Uh, I don't know what the third game is going to be, but it'll be something. It'll be glorious and it'll be fully painted by the end of the year. But that's going to be really exciting. And then this third one, it's not actually a painting project. I want to have played 10 games of 40K by the end of the year. Don't know how that's going to happen, but it's going to happen. I talk a lot of smack about 40K. And I actually have not played a single game of 9th edition. To be fair, I painted, I played a bunch in 8th edition and I played a lot in 6th and 7th edition. So I almost know what I'm talking about, except not really because 9th edition is very different. But I want to get in the games. I also do love 40k. 40k is a super fun game. Whenever I see my models, I'm like, ah, oh, I want to field a whole blob of models and charge them across the table. Skirmish games are really fun and interesting and exciting, but... There's something to be said for just a mountain of minis going against another mountain of minis. By the end of the year, I want to have played 10 games of 40k. And by the time, I, if I've played 10 games of 40k, then I feel like I can really, I have the go ahead to really razz on 40k and talk about what's good, what's bad, what's in, what's out, what's up, what's down. I think uh, I, I do want to have that experience under my belt so I can really talk about the game. And speaking of 40k, this week, Games Workshop is dropping that they're going to be offering a streaming service. What? <laughs> Why? Why would they do a streaming service? It is the craziest thing I could even imagine. Like, I mean, I did, I had a hypothesis that they could do something like this when they started buying, when they started uh, integrating all of those different content creators into their website. But a streaming service, like streaming services need to drop with billions of hours of content like Netflix has billions of hours of content Disney Plus probably the most successful one to drop in recent memory they dropped with every Disney anything ever made and that's the reason they were successful people are like yeah I'll, I'll get it for Star Wars and it's a good deal because I might watch 101 Dalmatians once this year like that's the reason that is successful there's currently like 25 minutes of content out there for Warhammer 40k like if you if you combine all of the different uh, all of the different short films that they've had a hand in Astartes wonderful brilliant it's like 11 minutes long you no one's gonna sign up for a streaming service for 11 minutes of content so I hope two things I hope that either they there's something they're not telling us like they have five full-size TV shows that are ready to rock and roll because that would probably be worth it. Like, I'd watch a little a little Astartes and then a little uh, a little Age of Sigmar something something. Uh, the story of a clan rat, uh, you know, finding his place in the world. That would be really cool. That's not what's going to happen. The other thing I've heard from a smattering of YouTube videos that probably don't know what they're talking about and the Warhammer community page that probably doesn't know what it's talking about, the uh, that they're going to be, this is going to be a little bit more of like a VIP situation where you might get other things that aren't streaming content like I don't know discounts or miniatures and that seems like a horrible idea to me um, I'm not a big fan of like those VIP points things from different stores I think Lego has one where if you spend 10 grand you get like an extra th Darth Vader 
But um, I, I want, from a streaming service, I want streaming content. That's all I want. I'm a man of simple taste. That's all I want. If there's cool minis, I'll buy them. I'll just go out and find them and get them if I really want them. I don't want to have to access those through a VIP 40k service. I mean, they might have something planned that'll knock my socks off and, you know, I'll be like, oh my gosh, I need this, but it won't happen. <laughs> it just won't. Why would they do a streaming service? That is really what they should have done is they should have started like the, the 40k YouTube channel, you know, or maybe they could do something like if you, if you spend like $30 on 40 on Warhammer a month, you get access to the, the VIP thingy and you get access to this streaming service. So you have to download an app to your phone and then you forget the password and then you have to do a thing so that you can't log in. Like, just make it easy. I know the easier you make it, the less money you make. That's the real problem. <laughs> if it's just a YouTube channel that people can watch, they make significantly less money than if they sign up and they, they sell their data to the streaming service and then it's... But holy moly, I can't wait to see how this shakes out. Some people have hypothesized that they could have sunk way too much money into this and it's gonna hurt them. I bet they've sunken like 50 bucks into this. <laughs> I bet it's not much money at all for them. And like Games Workshop is not, they don't have all the money in the world to be spending on a, on a service anyway. I bet they've spent very little. <laughs> like maybe probably less than f what it costs to keep Forge World run in a year. And they're barely keeping Forge World going. I mean, every now and then they'd probably, you know, they shovel 50 bucks into the furnace of Forge World so that they can buy more silicone to still not have the Dimacurion back in stock, but holy moly, Games Workshop. Ah, <laughs> uh, what a bunch of silly Brits. Star Wars Legion. I painted this lovely speeder bike and ah, oh, this model is fantastic. It's brilliant. It's absolutely beyond brilliant to give the Luke's land speeder vehicle to the Rebel Alliance it's great that you have the Rebel guy just sitting on the back. Super, very interesting and fun model to paint up. It has, I think on this model, I really started to solidify why I have so much fun painting Legion models, and it's because of the size. When you're painting something of this size, but that still has this amount of detail, every brush stroke really does bring it to life. Like, I feel like when you're painting a Space Marine, you know, how much fun are you having when you're blocking out the armor? Like, oh, I gotta get the shoulder pads white, I gotta get the body black for Black Templar, gotta get those decals on, and then I start to get to have the fun of painting the pouches and the swords and the eyeballs and all the different heraldry. With the Rebel models, you know, I mean, you paint you paint the shirt brown in one brush stroke, and then all of a sudden you're highlighting, you're bringing that shirt to life. You're already rocking and rolling. So that's why I think Star Wars Legion is having so much, is so much fun for me to paint. And also, I mean, there's a Star Wars miniature. I now have Luke's Landspeeder with a Twi'lek rocket launcher and a Rodeon gunner. I mean, it's super fun. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I painted the pilot like Marty McFly with a blue with a blue button down shirt and a uh, orange, a orange vest. And I think that is super funny. But yeah, super excited to paint this expansion pack. Uh, and I can't wait to paint all the rest of the of the Legion stuff and get a few games in of Legion. Oh, and this week, speaking of Star Wars, I got to play some X-Wing. I played a game of Kill Team and I won, and then I played a game of X-Wing and I lost. But this is a game. This was a game of X-Wing, uh, first edition, and it reminded me. I think X-Wing is way more tactical than uh, 40k Kill Team. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that out into the world. I think it is far more tactical, even though there's a million less things to do in X-Wing. But I think that is actually why X-Wing feels more exciting, or not more exciting, but more. Like, when I was finished with the game of Kill Team, I was like, yay, one. But then when I was done with the game of X-Wing, I was like, holy moly, that was a, that was a fight. That was, you're, 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 you're moving and you're grooving and you're, you're dodging and you're bobbing and weaving. Like, cause the thing about, of, about Kill Team, even though Kill Team is a lot quicker paced than 40k, cause you go back and forth, you know, I, I punch and then who has the next highest or who, who gets to punch next and then you go and you go and you go and you go. But Kill Team does end up having a lot of downtime. 
The thing about Kill Team is because you have so many different phases, you have the act, the, the initiative phase, and then you move into the movement phase, and then you move into the shooting phase, and then the psychic either comes before or after the shooting phase, and then you have the fight phase, and the fight phase is goddamn ridiculous with all the different rules for who went what, and who gets three inches, and how where can you use those three inches, and what direction are you allowed to move, and are you allowed to move within one inch of another enemy player, and then you get to the garbage that is the, uh, the leadership phase where there's two different roles you have to do and they both require two different but very similar stats you need to look at to see what you roll for and in all of that mucking around i feel like the game does slow a little i mean kill team is a quick game you get it done you know under an hour easy but uh when when we, we switched over to x-wing i mean it's move shoot move shoot move shoot move shoot move shoot it's just so quick and you're like, ah, okay, I gotta turn my dial. Okay, if I do a three speed maneuver, that might get me so that I can look at his butt and then I'll get my two attack die and then I'm gonna modify those two attack die with my predator attack card. It's just quick. The, since it gets, it just kind of cuts out all of the mess of trying to, trying to do a thing to, oh, I missed, but maybe I'll get to shoot in one minute after we've already gone through another movement phase. One thing I wish Kill Team had more of is moving. I mean, the movement phase almost makes or breaks a whole turn in Kill Team, because, you know, either a model is out of range of everything and doesn't get to shoot or didn't charge anything. You know, there's plenty, been plenty of times where it's like, all right, fight phase. Fight phase is over, nothing's in combat. There's no moments like that in X-Wing because, you know, you're either moving or you're shooting. And so I think the, the quick pace of X-Wing really kind of, it keeps, it keeps the excitement up. It really does remind me of like I like I used to box and you know boxing it looks it looks like a thing but once you're in a fight and you know every every split second is like 10 minutes and as soon as you're done with a fight you're just like oh god holy moly that was I just spent a year <laughs> in that ring and that's kind of what X-Wing feels like a little bit is after after the X-Wing battle you're like holy moly like that was the water slide experience of the 10 seconds of, of craziness, and now you can take a step back and look at that experience, and now you're like, I'm ready to go back in. <laughs> I'm ready to wait in line, I got my fast pass, I'm ready to rock and roll again. <laughs> X-Wing's a really goddamn fun game. I'm a little interested to try out Series 2, especially since Series 2 has so many cool new ships, but uh, eh, we'll see. X-Wing, wait, X-Wing, that's the tricky thing with these editions. X-Wing, first edition is really, really fun. And I know there was definitely like a very strong, um, a very strong competitive side to X-Wing. And so for that competitive side, I'm sure that second edition solved every problem they had. But I think for your average Joe Schmo player, eh, series one is so much fun. Why would I spend, you know, 175 bucks to upgrade everything into series two so that it can still continue to be a very fun game? I think, uh, I think, I don't know if there was a way to fix it. I don't know if uh, X-Wing just needed a revamp or it needed it needed a facelift, but I don't know. I wasn't too excited about X-Wing second edition back in the Dizze. And it's still, it's not an exciting thing. It's just like, a, eh, maybe it's worth a shot. But that is my Wargaming for the week. It is time to end this episode with a story. Now, this show is called Models and Memories because of the relationship between memories and models. All of this stuff you see behind me are my objects and they all contain memories of what I was doing and thinking when I acquired, built, or collected them. And so this week... Hey, what the heck? I'll talk about this guy. This is a Bandai First Order Stormtrooper. It's basically a Gundam. It, all the different pieces and parts it comes in. It is incredibly poseable, and I bought this very soon after I saw Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens, and loved it. I mean, that was quite a time. I remember uh, watching every single movie leading up to the release of 7, uh, unfortunately, we watched them in the wrong order. We watched the trilogy first. We watched them in release order, so we watched the trilogy and we were like, yeah! And then we watched the prequels and we were like, ugh! And then it was time for Seven, and Seven was an amazing breath of fresh air for Star Wars, and it introduced a lot of really fun new things, like the First Order Stormtrooper, the slick, sexy version of the Stormtrooper. And, uh, it seems like 
the thing that they were doing with the new stormtroopers is they were making them a little bit more fearsome. Uh, their their faces. I don't know if their faces are scarier or sleeker. It's a little bit like a. It's like the modern iPhone take on a stormtrooper helmet, a little bit. But um, it seems like they were trying to make the stormtroopers a little scarier. They had their uh, their riot batons and and uh, and shields. I remember the one that fights Finn. He goes traitor, and then he takes out his little thingy, and the internet went wild. It was glorious. But uh, this model was really fun. It was the first thing I had really ever done like this. Building building kind of a miniature. And I've built a couple more like this since. But it is actually a really fun departure from classic model painting. Because this guy doesn't have that much paint on him. Well, the, really, the big thing I did was I took black paint, just put it in my hands, and then I just rubbed it all over the model to bring out all of the little details. And then I actually uh, took like Windex and I rubbed it off so that his armor stayed nice and clean. And it turned out really, really nice. And even though I could have bought, I mean, this guy wasn't even that expensive. I could have just bought an action figure that was this good <laughs> and painted probably nearly as well. Um, but I don't know, the fact that he's a Gundam is really interesting. The fact that I, I built him, it, it just all, the, the fact that I picked out his weapons, because he comes with all the different guns that the First Order of Stormtroopers had in the movie. But the fact that I picked out that this is going to be the Riot Baton guy, and I remember I got one of those uh, chrome pens and I painted all the little metal doodads on him to be chrome. It really made for a really, really fun painting experience. I never, I never really got into Gundams or anime that much. And so that stuff never really appealed to me. But the maker aspect of those things does appeal to me a lot. And I think, I think for the war gamers out there, I think taking little breaks, like little adjacent trips down other war gaming avenues is definitely worthwhile. Like this, this was a fun trip into Gundam territory. I think it'd be really cool to get like a tank and try to build a photorealistic, like historical tank. I think that would actually be a neat, a neat almost adventure to go on. And I mean, obviously this was an easy trip to take because Star Wars is just so great. And Star Wars Episode 7 was so great. I remember uh, in anticipation to go see Star Wars Episode 8, Attack of the Eight or whatever it was called. I remember trying to get my hair into the Ray Three Bob haircuts. I didn't have enough time. My hair wasn't my hair wasn't in good enough uh, shape to be able to do that. And I think she had extensions on. I don't think. I think it's very tricky to pull off that exact haircut with uh, with real hair. But yeah, this guy was a lot of fun. In the movies, I felt like the uh, the new stormtroopers. The the head is amazing, but the bodies look a little poofy. And it might just because they had like real stunt performers and stuff in the costumes instead of like malnourished uh, British extras like they had in the original trilogy. And they weren't CGI like in the prequels. Thank goodness. But uh, I really do like the new Stormtrooper look. They, they sort of, they sort of, it sort of went away from the new scary Stormtroopers in the, uh, in the new movies 7, 8, and 9 because the new 7, 8, and 9 were much more about the characters than the events in the worlds. And so the uh, the stormtroopers and everything that really wasn't the Jedi took a backseat to uh, to allow for a really really in depth and interesting character development. But uh, I don't know. That's why I think that they should they should do away with trilogies and just make Star Wars movies. I think just a little story about people running away from stormtroopers. They should make a movie called Rogue One. That would be a great movie. <laughs> but it should be about the, this era of Star Wars. I think it'd be really cool. Learned about all the different types of uh, First Order Stormtroopers and how these guys differ. I mean, they're, they, I think they were child soldiers because Finn, poor old Finn. That also makes me wonder, I mean, this could be, I mean, this probably isn't John Boyega. I was thinking about it. I was thinking about doing the uh, the blood on his helmet, like you see at the very beginning of the movie when he becomes disillusioned with the First Order, which also, the opening of Seven is so brilliant. I mean, you've got, you've got, Everything you need to know about the world explained through John Boyega and uh, Poe Dameron. A little bit of BB-8 thrown in there for good measure. And Kylo Ren, like, brilliant, brilliant opening. But I definitely I definitely think it is a, uh, a good idea to try out some hobby-adjacent things. Because you might, uh, you never know. I have, I have bought a fair few of these things now. And I plan on doing some more. I have a scout trooper that's sitting in a box. And I would love to uh, pick a pose for him. My plan was to build the scout trooper. He comes with the bike. And then I was going to build the bike sitting next to a log. And then I was going to figure out a pose for the scout trooper, glue him in place, green stuff, green stuff, all of the little under armor and make him into just like a really, really cool scout trooper statue. 
Because as cool as all like the pose ability stuff is, it's not like I play with this guy. Like it'd be, you know, if I could just find the perfect pose, I think I'd be very happy with that. But yeah, Bandai, First Order Stormtrooper, and my eternal love of Star Wars. That is the story for this episode. If you guys get a kick out of this show and you want to help support it, the best way to support us is by becoming a member of our Patreon. On the EOB Patreon, you'll get access to some behind the scenes voting on what models I paint live on YouTube and a hobby hangout live stream every Friday nights. But that is it for this episode of Models and Memories Weekly Episode 10 Rogue Paint. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And now it's time for the real star of the show, the submissions this week for EOB Complete. We put out a challenge to our community to send us before and after photos of their recently finished models to be immortalized in our videos. If you want to join in the fun, you can submit a before and after photo of your painted mini to our Discord server, which you can find in the description below, or you can post it to Instagram with the hashtag EOBcomplete. Without further ado, let's look at and get inspired by what the folks have finished this week. Some terrain by Decimation, some Space Dwarves by T in the Sahara, a tank by Finnan, a Primaris Apothecary by Zerul, some Grey Knights by Barry, a Zombie Cowboy by Alexander452, some Chaos Dwarves by Disco, a Fallout Robot by Walter, a Clone Trooper by Wolfpack, some Space Marines by Red Badger91, an Orc Wartrike by Tyrant Red, a Soldier by CDR Keller21, a Necron Triarch Stalker by Vega Wusky, a Bellacor by Stinky Pete, a Rough Rider by Bagpipe Man, a Guardsman by Just Make Stuff, a Tyranid by Changed My Name So It's Easier For Jay, a Stormcast and Chaos Warrior by Mauricio44, a Slambo by Breadboy2, a Stormcast Eternal by Mr. Creant, a Necron Monster by Bigus Dickus, a Custom Guardsman by 40k Tanith, a Vampire Hunter by Comic Con Omix, a Dark Angel Terminator by Dro Dracos, and a Knight by Kakilla. Congratulations to everyone for a job well done. It's no small feat to get paint on a mini and you all should feel really proud. Nothing gets the hobby juices flowing like finishing a project and we all thank you for sharing your work, motivating us and the hobby community to paint our plastic. Thanks for sharing.